thankful for this day. We're thankful for um, a nice break from school and a chance to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. And we're thankful for American Heritage School and for this course and for all the things we're learning. And please help us to have Thy Spirit with us today as we talk about uh, President Truman's decision and um, that we will <clears throat> learn a lesson about finding wa finding ways in our own lives to to withhold judgment and, and leave things certain things unto thee to decide and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ Amen Amen Well thank you very much Wendy I appreciate appreciate your prayer and. Um, certainly we'll be talking a lot today um, about um, President Truman's uh, decision um, and certainly trying to just, you know, understand lots of different angles, but of course, um, as you said, leaving judgment to the Lord. Um, and uh, I'm grateful about that. <laughs> it certainly makes my life a little easier. Um, well, if, if, we, if we look here, uh, we'll talk about actually the roads to not only VJ Day or Victory Japan, uh, but also VE Day, Victory Europe. And so, you know, um, the slogan was that America and the other allies, you know, they were going for the double V, the double victory against uh, Germany and Japan. Uh, and so we'll look today then at um, the surrender of both both um, the Axis powers in the Eastern Theater as well as in uh, the Pacific Theater. Um, okay, well, if we take a look then um, at this framing question that I wanted to just to... to used is, is something that hopefully will be in the back of our minds today as we look at both the end of the war in Europe and the Pacific. Um, of course, the great quote um, found um, in uh, 2 Timothy, Paul's, Paul's letter to Timothy, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. So, what does this famous quote um, mean to you, and what lesson does it teach you? Well, <clears throat> Um, it, to me, it's always meant endurance and um, keeping keeping on God's side until the end, and not giving up, um, fighting even when when there's no hope that you're going to win in the short term. Um, but your emphasis on the word "my" I've never considered that before. Oh, that, well, actually, and actually, that um, that's that's actually from the the scripture reference. Oh, that, okay. And and um, and I I have uh, read that whenever you see italicization in the Bible, mm -hmm. that means that the translators were not sure if that was the correct translation or not, but that was their best guess. Okay. Anyway, so yeah. I'm, you know, I, so I'm not sure what the the original was, but but that that italicization is uh, is actually from the New Testament. Okay. Yeah, I remember that now. From there's some scriptures on eating meat, and they always italicize those because they it's not they weren't really sure, but. That that rings a bell. Oh, okay. Well, anyway. Yeah, and, and I, you know, I, I like you. You know, I, I think about this, and, and I mean, of course, there's so many applications, right? Because you know, if you think about um, you know what missionaries teach, you know, you talk about um, you know the first principles and ordinances, and you talk about you know faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and repentance and baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, and you talk about the gift of the Holy Ghost, you know. Um, but then after all that's you know done, sort of the first time. <laughs> Uh, then we have this, you know, enduring to the end, which is sort of this fifth thing that I think too, too often we kind of tack on, oh, yeah, and then you endure to the end, you know. Uh, but really, isn't that what most of our lives, you know, is yeah, been doing? that's, that's the hard part. <laughs> that's, that's the real hard part, you yeah. know. Anyway, uh, and so I was thinking a lot about that, and as I thought about that, I thought about this, this, uh, this great story, uh, this great quote, well, the story uh, by, uh, by Elder Thomas S. Monson uh, before he was President Monson, uh, finishers Wanted. I'm not sure if you remember this story, if you've heard of it before, um, but it was from the end sign in July, all the way back in 1972, um, and uh, I guess that's really not that long ago, but especially, you know, when we start in 1600. Uh, but if we go to 17, 1972, uh, there's this neat quote, and um, he tells this story. He talks about how he was walking through downtown Salt Lake City, uh, and uh, he said, on when one Wednesday, I paused before the elegant show window of a prestigious furniture store, that which caught and held my attention was not the beautifully designed sofa, nor the comfortable appearing chair that stood at its side. Neither was it the beautiful <coughs> overhead. Rather, my eyes rested upon a small sign that had been placed at the bottom right-hand corner of the window. Its message would be, finishers wanted. The store had need of those persons who possessed the talent and the skill 
to make ready for final sale the expensive furniture that the firm manufactured and sold. Finishers wanted. The words remained with me as I returned to the pressing activities of the day. In life, as in business, there has always been a need for those persons who could be called finishers. Their ranks are few, their opportunities many, their contributions great. From the very beginning to the present time, a fundamental question remains to be answered by each who runs the race of life. Shall I falter or shall I finish? On the answer, await the blessings of joy and happiness here in mortality and eternal life in the world to come. So what do we think about that? Welcome, Christina. Hi. Just probably that, Go ahead. that the first four principles of the gospel, um, you know, that they get you on the path, but 90% of the work is here, you know? Yeah. In, in the enduring. Yeah, definitely. Well, well said. Christina, would you add anything to that? Well, I'm simply thinking about people I've seen who have done just what Wendy was saying, the first, the first principles and ordinances of the gospel, but then they kind of falter and kind of die out in the end. They don't go to church anymore, and it, it just makes me very sad because um, sometimes we, we focus so much on those first steps of how exciting it can be to, to learn of the gospel, to repent, to be baptized, but if you don't finish, then it's and in the scriptures it says it's almost worse to, to have the light of the gospel and then to reject it or, you know, fail to follow through rather than just not knowing it at all. So right. I really I really think this sign is on, you know, the celestial kingdom's door of just to finish what we start. I mean, in, in small things in life, but especially in the gospel and why we're really here. We're here to finish. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for that. Um, well, if we look then... Uh, of course, we're going to you know relate this to World War II, but before we do that, any any anybody want to share? You know, when have you finished well, uh, and what did you do to help yourself finish well? And what does it take? Well, I remember the last couple of uh, months of my mission, I I had an opportunity to attend the temple because it was in our um, I was down for a zone conference, and that was where the temple was. So I remember praying to know, you know. What did I need to give this last part of my mission? And the answer I got was, you need to give everything. And I remember, you know, thinking, well, how do I do that? You know, there's, there's a lot to prepare for going home. I'm so tired. But I think as I relied on the Lord, I was able to have the last months of my mission be the very best. Mm -hmm. Where I felt like I was more focused. I was enjoying the work more. I was, you know, just really a better, a better missionary than I ever had been. And I'm really grateful for that because then I can look back and just be very pleased instead of, oh, I was all worn out at the end. And I think what I did to help myself finish well was really to to real, to understand, kind of have the right perspective that this is going to end, and so there will be time to rest, but now is not the time. And just to really pray for help, I think, were the things that helped me finish well in that circumstance. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, and welcome, Walter. How are you today? I'm good. Good, good. We're grateful to have you. Uh, well, of course, you know, as, as we discussed the end of World War II, right, try to decide if the Allied forces, forces, sorry, if the Allied forces finished well, right? Why or why not? Just keep that in the back of your mind as we, as we start to look here. Well, let's look then, let's go to uh, the road to VE Day, Victory Europe. We'll look at the, the European theater and how uh, things ended there in, in, the, uh, in the war. Well, on the Eastern Front, because of course in the European theater you have an Eastern Front, um, and then a Western Front. On the Eastern Front, Hitler, like Napoleon, and this is so interesting that this happened again, right? History does, in many ways, repeat itself. Um, like Napoleon, ignored the brutal Russian winter to the great disadvantage of his army. In 1943, with his forces decimated by the ravages of the winter of 42-43, Hitler lost at Leningrad and Stalingrad, uh, and the Soviets pushed the Germans back toward Berlin. With aid from the U.S., Stalin's forces held control of the Eastern Front for the rest of the war. If we look at the Western Front, then, we have two Allied invasions that secure it. The first is the invasion of Italy. From July 1943, the Allies invaded Italy, beginning at Sicily, right, that island. If, if, uh, if Italy is a boot, right, uh, or uh, if it's a soccer cleat, right, then the soccer ball, or what the boot is kicking, uh, is Sicily. Um, 
Mussolini resigned power as a result of this invasion, uh, and then Italy signed an armistice with the Allied nations. And so this is where you see uh, Italy then um, coming over and, and some Italians fighting with the Allies um, as also part of the liberation of their country and then also for the rest of the war. Um, Germany continued fighting on the Italian peninsula through 1944, so even though the Italians gave up, the Germans didn't. Uh, after victories at Monte Cassino and then Anzio uh, in May of 1944, the Allies liberated Rome from Nazi rule. So this is when we see this great liberation in Rome. Uh, and also you'll notice that there'll be a great liberation in Paris as well, these two great cities that had come under Axis control uh, during the war. Well, here's a, here's a very telling picture uh, that I have for you. It's uh, from the Italian campaign that we see an Allied soldier in the fore um, who's standing in the ruins of the Catholic Church in Aserno. Uh, and I want us to reason, what does this picture teach you about World War II? And how is it symbolic? Well, it shows how, um, how civilians were involved, how how things as as benign as churches and religions were involved and, and were destroyed. It it depicts it it evokes a lot of uh, solitary contemplation. And I don't know. Those are a couple. yeah yeah great great answer, Wendy. Thank you for sharing that. Um, anybody else um, want to share about this one? Yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I like Wendy, I'm just so struck by, by looking at this here, and of course we can see this is the, this is the altar in the, in the chapel, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's been um, just devastated by, by a bombing raid. Um, we can see um, that the bombs have, you know, brought the roof of the chapel down on, uh, you know, the, the, the communion table, the, this sacrament table. Um, and just to think about how, you know, war in so many ways uh, just can can um, do such terrible things uh, to, as Wendy said, things as as, as sacred um, as uh, you know religious belief, um, uh, the right to worship, as well as the the practical act of worshiping and the physical structures of worship and that sort of thing. And we think about um, you know wars uh, and and truly you know uh, there's no there's no war that has been going on longer than the war in heaven that continues to to try to take away agency today. And so war always has attacked, you know, our spirituality, our religion. Um, and so, you know, truly we, uh, we need to have these moments of quiet contemplation to understand, well, you know, as we, as we learned from the Holocaust, you know, they can take away everything externally, but what's inside is what counts. Because really, even if you don't have a beautiful building to worship in, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that you can't be spiritual um, and uh, that you can't live the gospel. Right? It's not about the physical things as much about as it is about the spiritual. And, and so I love seeing this soldier contemplating, you know, probably God and, and the effects of the war uh, reaching into even um, the life of religion in, uh, in Italy. So, um, if, we, if we look then at the second invasion, and this one is a little more famous, uh, but this is, the, uh, this is the second invasion that secured uh, the Western Front um, in, in Europe. Uh, welcome, Heidi. How are you? Heidi. Hello. Welcome. Um, so if we look at this second invasion um, that secured the Western Front, the first, of course, uh, being the invasion of Italy that we just talked about, uh, this is the invasion of France. Um, June 6, 1944 is when it began, uh, the event uh, known as D-Day. And, and D, literally, it was just sort of uh, the day of days. It was the, the day that the operation was to take place. Um, and so it actually doesn't stand for anything other than, I, I looked this up, just, um, you know, sort of D is in, this is the, the day of decision, the day that we're going to go, but just the, sort of this day of days um, that's marked on the calendar for, with a D. Um, the Allies invaded France at the beaches of Normandy, as, as of course, we, we probably heard, right? This was the largest ship-borne assault in history. We saw 156,000 British, American, and Canadian troops ferried by 4,000 vessels. Uh, including um, several groups that were dropped behind enemy lines by parachute the night before. Um, and some, some of them had uh, just uh, a, horrendous, a horrendous time, and then, and then others uh, made it safely and were able to really uh, work from behind to help uh, their, their brothers um, in combat 
uh, come onto the beach. Um, anyway, but lots of uh, from from uh, St. Mary Glees and, and other small French towns where these power troopers were, were uh, they, 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 they were uh, pushed off course by the wind, they were dropped in the wrong places, they were um, they landed on, on, on churches, you know, cathedrals, uh, clock towers. They were just sitting ducks for Germans, and it just was a really uh, a very sad, a very sad time. But other others uh, were able to to land. And but as, as we as we look at this here, we see uh, that the main invasions came along uh, a very long beachhead that uh, that had five sectors that the Allies um, codenamed Juno, Gold, Omaha, and Utah, respectively. Uh, within a week. Uh, after after this D-Day invasion that eventually was successful, the French coast was secure, and the Allies had more troops in France than Germany did. Um, with those troops, the Allies then marched from Normandy, from the coast, and then kept going uh, inland. Uh, and then on August 25th, the Allies liberated Paris. Uh, and by mid-September, the Germans had retreated out of France and Belgium for the most part. Now, I heard a lot of ringing, ringing of bells. Uh, is everything okay? Can everybody hear me? I can. Okay. I can. Great. Okay, great. And welcome, Caden. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, if we if we take a look, then uh, here's a picture from the liberation of Paris. Um, one of the things that I enjoy about it is that you can actually see the color, uh, because as we know, right, the world wasn't in black and white back then. Um, even though I thought that when I was little, I think. <laughs> um, but here's the liberation of Paris, of course, right, the um, Arc de Triomphe. Uh, we see this sign here, right? Vive de Gaulle, vive de Gaulle, long live de Gaulle. And you ask yourself, why de Gaulle? Well, um, he was, of course, commander of the Free French Forces uh, that had been fighting with the Allies outside of France uh, throughout the whole war. And then, of course, uh, when the Allies came and liberate, liberated pa pa Paris, uh, de Gaulle, the leader of the Free French, then was able to assume control, uh, and he would actually be in control of France uh, as a leader from 45 to 46. Then he would step down, but then he would come back and he would have a uh, presidency um, of 11 years, 58 to 69. And so those 13 years uh, would really be pivotal in uh, creating, creating modern France. Now, let's see, I see, let's see, what is this? Oh, yes, okay. A little chat, okay. Private. Well, so if we look at de Gaulle then, just, uh, just sort of as an interesting side note to see, you know, the Allies coming in and then dropping de Gaulle off and then heading on their way to fight the rest of the war, you know, in Germany. Uh, you know, de Gaulle would promote uh, conservative and authoritarian constitutionalism. He was certainly on the right, uh, but uh, at times he ruled by decree, at least at the beginning of the new uh, French Constitution, um, and was always a very charismatic figure, uh, figure created his own sort of cult of personality, um, and um, believed in, in the power of the people, but also in a very, very strong executive. Uh, he believed in an independent France, um, and Europe, and that meant independent of the U.S. and the USSR later on in the Cold War. He really felt that they should be this sort of buffer in between the two superpowers. They wanted to do their own thing, didn't want to be entangled in, in either side. Uh, but he felt uh, that France needed to be part of a strong Europe, uh, and that was uh, through the European economic community. Um, uh, but de Gaulle's conception of the European economic community excluded Great Britain. Um, which uh, he always had a problem with. He felt that they were much too um, in league with uh, the Americans and that they weren't, um, they didn't have the interests of, of continental Europe at heart. Also, he believed in French nuclear uh, weapons um, creation uh, and testing, and by 1960, France had its own nuclear weapons. Uh, he believed in a greater industrialization for France, and so set them on a course that way. He believed in a strong franc, and so uh, he tried very, uh, for a very long time to deal with uh, heavy inflation and to uh, decrease uh, that inflation by making the francs stronger. Um, he did not believe in participating in NATO, and so he withdrew troops uh, from NATO, and so France didn't participate, even though officially they were still on the books, but he took all the troops away from NATO, and, and he kicked out uh, other members of NATO from France uh, because he believed in an independent France. Uh, he believed in a free Algeria, and so as part of French colonialism, this was one of the first, there was this uh, you know, liberation movement um, in de decolonization movement in Algeria, and he granted decolonization to Algeria. Uh, he also believed in a separate Quebec, and actually even you know campaigned for it, uh, meaning separate from uh, British Canada that they should be their own country, which is interesting as we saw you know just in the past few years uh, another push for a separate Quebec. Uh, he also uh, was an activist against uh, the U.S. in its uh, war in Vietnam. Uh, he was also um, anti-socialist. 
Um, and so just a very, an interesting character, had a lot to do with, with modern France. But uh, we see here this, this sign, uh, Vive de Gaulle, with uh, this great portent for the future of, of, uh, of France. Well, if we go back to, uh, to VE Day, then, and, and see the, the road, um, of course, now, if we've gotten through Italy and we've gotten through France, right, Germany is the last stop on the bus. Uh, and so following the Battle of the Bulls in December of 1944, British and American soldiers poured into Germany from the west. And then on the east, we see uh, January of 1945, the Soviets launched an offensive from the east into Germany. Uh, in the spring, both forces, uh, the Allies uh, as well as the Soviets, they converged on Berlin. Uh, Hitler committed suicide, and then Victory Europe was secured um, on the 8th of May, 1945. Well, if we look then at a document that you read from the 7th of May, Excuse me. Um, we see the German Act of Military Surrender, um, and it states an interesting thing that I, I just was, I started thinking a lot about. Uh, it states that no ship, vessel, or aircraft is to be scuttled. I'm not sure if you if you took the time to, to look that up or if you knew what it meant, um, but reason, right? What does scuttle mean here? What does it mean? Uh, sunk on purpose. Well, say that. Say that one more time. Uh, sunk on purpose. Yeah, so, so, so sunk or destroyed or damaged on purpose. Yeah, excellent. Um, and if we look at that, right, um, and relate it, when might we be tempted to scuttle, kind of, you know, in this sense of the word? Are we ever tempted to do this? Because as, as I thought about it, I thought of several instances when it, when it seemed tempting uh, to me when I wasn't acting with the Spirit. Um, Can we think of any situations um, in our lives when uh, somebody else wins, so to speak, and yet we don't really want them to enjoy their victory? Um, we don't want them to, 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 to earn what is theirs by virtue of this victory. Uh, I think figuratively here, of course. Um, what do you think? When does that happen for us? I, I have a question real quick. Sure. Um, is this directed to the Allies? Yes, yes. So this, this is, this is uh, Germany's declaration of surrender to the Allies. Okay. There's, yeah, they're, they're saying that, you know, we, 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 we um, should not do this, we won't do it, we're letting you know. Okay. Um, I would think, you know, maybe in, like, um, athletics, if, if you um, win a game, I, I guess, you know, the, the coaches always say, you know, be good sports about it, you know, and don't really rub it in. Um, there's that sense, but... You know, it could, it could also be in you know all aspects of life. I mean, if you're in debate, it's always good to keep your composure if you win or lose. Um, there's there's uh, there sometimes humans are related to crabs in that you know if if you put crabs in a boiling pot and one crab starts getting out of the boiling pot, another crab will grab his leg and pull him back down. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sad because in a way it's true that you know we as we being human. Um, feel, sometimes we feel like we all need to be equal in every single way. And that if we see our neighbors or, or our friends or our siblings getting above in an aspect of life, getting above of us, sometimes we feel like we need to pull them back down to our level. Mm -hmm. um, and vice versa, sometimes we feel like if we are getting above someone, we need to push them down lower to make them feel like you're nothing. Yeah. Um, so maybe that and it's I think it's all pride, you know, and I guess that might be what it means in, in this in a spiritual sense. Um, is how you wouldn't you wouldn't scuttle anybody, you know, per se if you weren't prideful. Yeah, um, definitely. So, yeah. That's a great great comment, Caden. Thank you so much for that. You know, and you know, why why is it? I was just thinking about this. Why is it that, you know, when we're not happy, we don't want anyone else to be either sometimes, right? <laughs> You know, um, it's, just, yeah. it's so interesting to me. I thought, and I thought about the prodigal son, and I thought about how that elder brother, right, he couldn't be happy for his younger brother's victory, right, coming back, repenting, coming home. He couldn't be happy for it. And in a way, he tried to scuttle the party, right? Uh, it made me think of this great quote by Elder Holland. Um, who would like to read this for us? I'll read it. About the older brother. Thanks so much. Okay. But the older brother lives in some confinement, in some confinement too. He has, as yet, been unable to break out of the prison of himself. 
He is haunted by the green-eyed monster of jealousy. He feels taken for granted by his father and dis disenfranchised by his brother when neither is the case. He has fallen victim to a fictional affront. As such, he is like um, Tantalus of Greek mythology. He is up to his chin in water, but he remains thirsty, never, nevertheless. One who has heretofore presumably been very happy with his life and content with his good fortune suddenly feels very unhappy simply because another has had some good fortune as well. Who, do you want me to read this, uh, this second bullet point? Please, thanks. Okay. Who is it that whispers so subtly in our ear that a gift given to another somehow diminishes the blessings we have received? Who makes us feel that if God is smiling on another, then he surely must somehow be frowning on us? You and I both know who does this. It is the father of all lies. Great. Thanks so much. Well, let's ponder mm -hmm. that as, as, we, as we move on here. But if we look at this, right, how are the Allies able to defeat Germany? Um, and if we think about this, right, what strategies for finishing well can you relate to your life and how? Did you, did you see anything they did to, you know, finish this war in the Eastern Theater? What would you say? I know the Battle of the Bulge, of, of the Bulge was significant, um, especially, you know, after, after D-Day, how, how the Allies were able to kind of go in, um, you know, to their, take the fight really to their land. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I understand that, you know, as the Germans retreated, they tried to blow up bridges behind them and stuff, and so the Allies couldn't go in further. Mm -hmm. um, but as to the final blow, I'm not actually sure what happened. I, I, I don't know what really, what was the, uh, what was the final deal? What, right, what, yeah, what? well after the two mainland, uh, two invasions, the one through Italy and then the one through France, uh, we had the Allied forces coming uh, through from the west into Germany, and then we had the Soviets who had secured uh, the eastern front of Germany, uh, right, with victories at Leningrad and Stalingrad, uh, and then they were able to come from the east, and so really, mm -hmm. Germany surrounded. You see forces coming from the west and the east into Germany and then finally into Berlin and then that's when everything crumbles and Germany surrenders. Interesting. Okay. Well, one thought that I've just had is um, they, they basically went to the source and they squashed out the source, meaning they, they went to where the real problem was and that's Germany where everybody, all the soldiers were coming from. And how I relate that to my life is um, there are often mistakes we make um, or problems that we might have um, that have all these different effects throughout our life, but it's really coming from the one source of something we might be doing wrong or maybe a, a bad relationship with somebody and it's just causing all these problems. So I think it just teaches me that to finish well and to really do well in life, we need to get rid of the, the things that are bad in our lives. We need to go to the source rather than just, you know, go around to the different effects or the different, like, branches coming from that, that main area. Yeah, that's a great comment, Christina. Thank you so much for that. Uh, well, if we, if we, if we, uh, if we move on then to VJ Day, looking at the road to victory Japan. Uh, June 1944, in some of the bloodiest engagements of the war, the U.S. captured from the Japanese, uh, Tinian, Guam, and Saipan in the Mariana Islands. This is in the Pacific. Uh, in October 1944, at Leyte Gulf in the Philippines, the U.S. defeated Japan in the largest naval battle in history, which crippled the Japanese Navy for the rest of the war. February 1945, the U.S. Marines captured Iwo Jima. Uh, we know the very famous sculpture, right, of the raising the flag, that sort of thing, uh, after the costliest battle in its history, the history of the United States Marine Corps. Uh, the U.S. then firebombed Tokyo in March of 1945, killing 80,000 people, uh, leaving a million homeless. Uh, in June of 1945, 3,500 Japanese kamikaze pilots purposefully used their planes as bombs. Right, so think of, you know, what happened with the World Trade Center, that kind of a kamikaze mission. Right, to hold off the American victory for weeks. Uh, following months of what is now known as island hopping, going from island to island in the Pacific, fighting and winning and then moving on, sometimes skipping islands, uh, the Japanese had almost no ships or planes left, uh, and the Japanese troops, to the last man stand on uh, these islands surrounding Japan, was finished. America then turned its attention to bombing the Japanese mainland, shelling industrial targets, merchant ships, which carried much needed oil, and then other cities. 1939, if we look at the Manhattan Project and how this was going on uh, as a precursor to VJ Day, uh, 1939, none other than Albert Einstein, uh, who had fled Germany for the U.S., 
told FDR about Germany's plans for an atomic bomb, one that would use his theory of relativity to convert matter into a tremendous, into a tremendous force of energy. So this is matter into energy. Don't ask me how. Um, I've just read that that's what it was. <laughs> but uh, FDR promoted American research on and then cr the creation of atomic weapons. And by 1942, the U.S. Army took control of a project to beat the Germans to the invention of an atomic bomb, one that would create a nuclear chain reaction from plutonium. They tried uranium first and then moved on to plutonium. Uh, the project would be called the Manhattan Project, and General Leslie Groves headed it and oversaw the distribution of $2 billion in its secret research laboratories in Tennessee, at Oak Ridge, New Mexico, at Los Alamos, and Washington State, uh, Richland, among other sites. And there's a map on the next page that I'll show you. Uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer, um, Oppenheimer, who you may have heard about, uh, a physicist at UC Berkeley, led the construction of the actual bomb at Los Alamos. Uh, and on the 16th of July, 1945, the project achieved success with a test bomb called Trinity. Truman, who had ascended to the presidency following FDR's death, um, after four terms, uh, right, he received the news at the Potsdam Conference. Well, here you can just sort of see how uh, big this Manhattan Project was. It wasn't just in one area, but in all the, look, there are two places in Utah, uh, Monticello or Monticello, and then uh, Wendover, uh, as well as all these other, other, other places here. Well, uh, if we look then at this Potsdam Conference, which will be very uh, important for uh, VJ Day, uh, at the Conference of Allied Leaders at Potsdam, Germany, Truman gave Japan an ultimatum. Unconditional surrender by August 3rd or complete devastation. But he did not mention how. He did not mention and the J Japanese did not know about the nuclear bombs. Um, the Japanese premier wanted to surrender, but Japan's generals refused. The Japanese government hinted that if it could keep its emperor, it might surrender, but the U.S. would not grant anything other than an unconditional surrender, even though, and it's important to note, even though that its terms in the final surrender would allow the emperor to remain. Some insiders believe that the Japanese would surrender within a few weeks, but Truman stuck to his ultimatum and, as August 3rd came and went, made the controversial decision to introduce atomic warfare to the world. So if we look at this here, atomic warfare, uh, some of the scientists involved, even in the Manhattan Project, along with many Christian groups and others, argued that as a matter of morality, the U.S. should not drop the bomb. But Truman would not budge. He countered by saying that he regarded the bomb as a military weapon and never had any doubt that it should be used, because of two reasons. The first was that it would save a million lives in exchange for about 200,000, and two, that it would quickly end a devastating global conflict that had raged since 1939. Uh, Truman believed that the Japanese would fight until the last man before ultimately losing, as they had on so many Pacific islands during the preceding months. And Truman wants to save both Japanese and American lives through the use of America's latest scientific breakthrough. If we look then at what happened on August 6th, um, true to the ultimatum, um, August 6, 1945, the American B-29 bomber Enola Gay dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, an industrial center. The bomb killed 80,000 civilians and completely decimated an area four miles square in the city center. And when I say decimated, I mean turned it to rubble and dust, nothing else. Um, many more suffered the terrible effects of nuclear burns and radiation for the rest of their usually shortened lives or passed them along to unborn children with uh, genetic uh, birth defects or passed along birth defects. It is impossible to calculate exactly how many people were killed or affected in other tragic ways from the effects of the bomb. Um, so here, this, this is an example, uh, or this gives you an idea of the devastation caused by the bomb uh, on Hiroshima. Uh, the picture on the left is the before shot of what the city looked like. Uh, the picture on the, left, on the right is the after, uh, and you can see that it is eerily devoid of life and structure. If we look then at the second bomb, on August 8th, the USSR coming in to uh, claim uh, its share of, of uh, the easy victory for them, uh, declared war on Japan. The Japanese government still could not agree to surrender as they were debating back and forth on what to do. And as they were procrastinating their decision, the US then said, OK, we'll drop number two. And on August 9th, the U.S. dropped its second atomic bomb, this time in Nagasaki. The bomb killed over 100,000 Japanese civilians and had even worse effects than the one dropped on Hiroshima. 
On August 14th, the emperor himself broke the stalemate in his cabinet and called for surrender. September 2nd, 1945, the surrender was made official aboard the Missouri, which was a U.S. battleship in Tokyo Bay, and the war was over. So, if we think about this, let's talk together, that's reason. Why did the U.S. drop atomic bombs on Japan? Well, according to Will President you explain Truman, to me his comment? Sorry, will you explain to me his comment about exchanging 200,000 lives for millions? Sure. Uh, Truman believed that an invasion of mainland Japan would cost up to a million lives. Uh, just because of, it, it, he looked American at... American and Japanese yeah. lives? Yes. Yeah, a, mil a million total lives. Um, and he believed that because the fighting uh, in the islands of the Pacific preceding uh, what what happened um, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki had been so terrible. I mean, just, you know, to the last man, tooth and nail, you know, no surrender, that kind of a thing. Um, he imagined that trying to force the Japanese to finally surrender by an invasion of mainland Japan, uh, that it just would be this horrendous um, and lengthy uh, and costly battle. Uh, and series of battles. And so because of that, he believed that it could take up to a million men. And so he said, well, we calculate that it would be about 200,000 people who would die if we dropped the bombs. And so based on our estimations, it could be up to a million people who would die on mainland Japan. Um, and so because of that, weighing my options, it seems to be a no-brainer. That was the way he described it, both, uh, his, at the, that, both in 1945 and then also up, up until he died uh, and in his memoirs. So did his numbers seem to be accurate? Uh, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that. That's actually coming up um, in a couple slides. OK, well, so anyway, I guess that would be one of the primary reasons mm -hmm. why they did it. Right. Yeah, I mean, really, for, for Truman, this was a clear-cut military decision. Nothing more, nothing less. It was, ad, it was, it was a decision of, of addition and subtraction, saying that you know, the numbers add up. Any, anything else? Uh, yeah. We're, are we? So you have three questions here. Are we? Are we free to discuss any, all three of these? If I want. Sure. To? Oh yeah. Yeah. We can. We can move on to another one. Uh, you know, in your opinion, was Truman justified in his decisions to drop uh, the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Um, and then, if you want, you could even talk about did dropping the bombs help or hurt the U.S. in finishing well? If you want. Okay. To talk. Sure. Well, back with Truman's reasoning, um, with how many lives would be saved and everything. I. I think. Uh, it's, I would rather, this, this might sound, this, this could sound really bad, um, but it's what I believe. I would rather, you know, um, during war, I'd rather a million soldiers die than 200,000 women and children, mm -hmm. um, considering they're not even in action. They're, mm -hmm. they're not, they're, they're not, that's not their role. Um, let the men go fight and, and kill each other in war. Mm -hmm. Let's let's do whatever we can to keep s s um, civilians um, out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and and just so you know, Kate, you're you're not you're not off the wall at all. That that's exact. That, that's one of the biggest reasons why people objected to the use of the bombs. Yeah. Um, just it's because just, they said, yeah. you know, hey, you know, soldiers fighting soldiers is one thing. Um, but soldiers, you know, fighting women and children uh, is a completely different different matter. And 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 in fact, it's a matter of morality. That, that's yeah. how a lot of people would, would talk about it. So thanks for that. Mm -hmm. uh, any, anybody else want to weigh in? Of course, you don't have to, but um, any other thoughts? I, I have to ask, what, how many days was it apart between the first and the second bomb? Right, so it was August 6th and then August 9th. Okay, I, I look at the, the earthquake in Haiti, and I, th I try to think about how much information did we have about that earthquake two days you know, two days after it happened versus mm -hmm. a week after it happened. I think it's un unconscionable that they would drop a second bomb just three days later. You know, before the government even had a chance to, to, to review what had happened, I, I really feel like if they'd have had more time to, to, to visit the, dis, the site of the destruction, and to, that, that they certainly would have surrendered without having to drop a second bomb. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, and that, and that's that's another that's another one of the points that a lot of people make that okay, even if the first one, you know, even if, if even if you could see using the first one, 
um, you know, how could you possibly justify the second one? Definitely, that's that's very very common. Um, thank you for pointing that out. Of course, all of this is just very sad. So I feel you know, that I, myself. That's that's a good point you bring up. I mean, wow, that that's just three days. And how can you justify that? That that kills me. Oh, that's nuts. And especially when when we today all the technology we have and and how long it took to get numbers to us about the earthquake in Haiti or in Chile, you know, um, with all the technology we have, and then and then they had so little access to the kind of technology that's prevalent today, and and yet, yeah, 36 hours later, it it's unthinkable to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, and, and also, why not? Why not drop the first bomb on on an island or something that that wasn't uh, that wasn't very that wasn't occupied? <laughs> Just mm -hmm. right, right. You know, to, to sort of yeah. show, give, give a give a show yes. of power, and then yes. let let them make the decisions. Mind. Yes, mm -hmm. it's amazing to me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Good, good, good points. All. Uh, well, if we if we look then, uh, of course, you know you, you've you've read some correspondence about about the uh, the bombs. Uh, Truman's letter to, to Richard Russell from Georgia. Uh, this was dated the uh, 9th of August, 1945. Uh, what does the president say about why he made the decision to use atomic weapons against Japan? How he felt about it, and then how he sees the Japanese. This is the letter where he said he's not going to do it unless it's absolutely necessary. Right. This is in our readings, right? Now this is this is page ninety six. This one. Okay. So he he says that his object is to save as many American lives as possible, but but to also save the lives of Japanese civilians. Mm -hmm. But he does right. call their leaders pig head pig headed. Mm -hmm. Right, he's not going to do he it. He can see the nation is, is very uncivilized, and he keeps calling the beast and, and like all of these, all of these mm -hmm. responses we read. Right, right. In, in, in both of the letters that you have from Truman, uh, he does use the phrase, the, the, the term beasts to describe the Japanese. It is true. It's a good, it's a good point, Christina. And I'm confused. This letter was written uh, between the first and the second bomb going off. Is that, is that correct? Right. And if we think about also, you know, the, the time it takes for news to travel to, you know, this is written August 9th, um, but, you know, I'm not sure if they had even been able to know about the second bomb yet, which, which, which so, was but, dropped on August 9th. But he certainly knew that the first one had gone off. So it, when he's saying, I'm not going to do it, does he, he's referring to the second one? Right, yeah, because he, here he talks specifically about wiping out whole populations. And so for him, you know, he hadn't yet wiped out whole populations because he hadn't had to use, you know, several bombs. He just used the first one. Oh, okay. Got I think when we read this, we were under the assumption that no bombs had been dropped. That he was saying he was really doubting whether or not he was going to use them. Mm -hmm. So it seems, I don't know, the letter seems quite callous knowing that he had already dropped one of the bombs. Mm -hmm. Just by saying, well, how many people were killed in the first bomb? I didn't get that written down. 80,000. 80,000. So he's sort of acting like, well, those 80,000 don't really count. We, ha we haven't killed the whole island yet. Right, right. Because that's what we're realizing he's referring to now when he's saying, I regret the necessity of wiping out a whole population. Mm -hmm. He must be talking about the whole civilization of Japan because... To me, I because, thought I mean, can you, even... Yeah, I was going to say, can you, can you imagine if a bomb had been dropped on Tokyo, right? I mean, I mean that, that, that's a completely different story. We're talking about millions and millions of people, you know, instead of, quote, unquote, just to Truman, 80,000. Well, and also the fact that he would say, just because they're beasts, we're not going to act like beasts ourselves. He'd already dropped a bomb. He already had acted like a beast. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, that, 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 obviously that's not in his eyes. I guess he only thinks he's a beast if he kills the whole... Popular. I don't know. That's, it doesn't make sense to me. Right, right. Yeah, no, these letters are very, uh, there's a lot of interesting, interesting information. Well, if, we, if we look at sort of this, this, uh, this sort of uh, a counter then to Truman, 
Here we have uh, Samuel McCray Cavert. Uh, he's a secretary uh, for the Federal Council of the Churches of Christ in America. Um, he, uh, of course, his letters also, this is on uh, August 9th, 1945, he says that many Christians are deeply disturbed by the use of atomic force against Japan. Uh, what reasons does he give? Uh, and then what does he urge Truman to do? Well, he says it's got indiscriminate destructive effects. Mm -hmm. it, there's no, it's going to kill everybody regardless of how guilty or innocent they are. Right. It, it, it doesn't discriminate between soldier or civilian. Definitely. Um, what, 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 else does he, what else does he say? Couple, uh, maybe a couple others. Well, he urges, um, they, they kind of urge to give Japan time to, to accept surrender terms, it looks like. Just what right. we were just talking about. Like, give them time to really realize what just happened before you do you know, anything worse than you've already done. Right, and, and also to verify facts about the new bomb, because they didn't know what hit them. They had no idea what this was or what the United States had. Uh, and so he's saying, you know, give, give them time, um, you know, before any further devastation by an atomic bomb is visited on them. Okay, you've dropped one, but give them time to understand what's going on before dropping another one. You know, little did he know the second one was dropped on August 9th in Japan. So he talks about here the, uh, the extremely dangerous precedent for the future of mankind that using a bomb like this sets um, as well. Well, if we, if we look then, um, uh, Truman responds to Cavert, uh, and how does he justify the use of atomic force against Japan? And then, as, as Christina pointed out, right, he characterizes the Japanese for the second time in, in, in these three letters, right, that you have, and, and second time in the two that he wrote, uh, as beasts. Um, but how does he justify the use of atomic force against Japan um, on page 99? Which page? Oh, the murder of prisoners of war. 99, Caden. Thank you. Well, he says it's the only language they understand. Mm-hmm. He talks about Pearl Harbor and his when he said prisoners of war. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. He, sa he says when you have to deal with a beast, you have to treat him as a beast. It is most regrettable, but nevertheless true. Well, if we, if we think about that, it made me think of, of this, this great quote by um, President Monson, who was quoting from My Fair Lady. Um, this is Eliza Doolittle. Um, she says, you see, really and truly, apart from the things anyone can pick up, the dressing and the proper way of speaking, the difference between a lady and a flower girl is not how she behaves, but how she's treated. I shall always be a flower girl to Professor Higgins, because he always treats me as a flower girl, and always will. But I know I can be a lady to you because you always treat me as a lady and always will. What's the message? Well, it kind of reminds me of the way we raise our children, that, you know, depending on, they always rise to what you think of them. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Wendy, what were you going to say? Just that calling someone a beast um, heightens the probability that you're going to treat them as a beast. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, definitely, and, 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 and I you know, say, I think it's a patient. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Any time I've ever in my life, I have, every time I've, I've ever heard anyone say the phrase, no one is more disturbed about this than I am, but <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I have never found that to be a sincere statement ever in my experience. Right. Yeah, thank you for, thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, I, I just think it's, it's just so interesting. I've just seen so many times, uh, especially you know, as a teacher, as a coach, you know, people act the way you treat them. In many cases, they really do. You know, I just, I mean, I could, I could tell story after story about a baseball team I coached, and, you know, I had this player who just, he had not had success as a baseball player. It's a, a, a good way of putting it, you know. He, he just struggled so much. But I treated him as if he could be a Babe Ruth. He could be the hero. And boy, you know what? He became the hero. Time and again that season. It was unbelievable. He came up to me after the season. He said, you know, you believed in me. Because you treated me like I could do it, I gained confidence, and then I did it. Right? I mean, isn't that the message of the gospel? Isn't that how we should look at people as children of God? And 
um, of course, you know, uh, feelings run so deep about a topic like this. Um, well, you know, I had, there are many different perspectives on, on this decision. I, I have a few of them for you, just to kind of give you an idea of, of, some, of some different things to bat around in, in your mind. Uh, Truman claimed that the decision to drop the atomic bomb was simple. As we've talked about, since the Japanese wouldn't agree to an unconditional surrender, he believed that an invasion of mainland Japan would have been necessary and cost a million lives. On the other hand, he asserted the atomic bomb had cost only, quote-unquote, about 180,000 lives and ended almost immediately the devastating conflict that had raged since 1939. The bomb had accomplished both of his military objectives, to save lives and end the war quickly. Truman's explanation has been accepted by a host of prominent statesmen and historians. Um, U.S. Secretary of War Henry Stimson, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, historian Herbert Feist, who wrote a major book about, about the bomb, uh, historian David McCullough, who wrote Truman, who won the Pulitzer Prize for that book, 92, um, Alonzo Hamby, uh, Robert Donovan, um, all agree that Truman's decision was a straightforward military no-brainer. Others, however, have not been so sure. Uh, PMS Blackett, who wrote Fear, War, and the Bomb in 1948, argued that the decision to drop the bomb was not so much the last military act of the Second World War as the first major operation of the Cold Diplomatic War with Russia. Wow, With the USSR ready to enter the war in the Pacific, was the bomb merely a way to contain the spread of communism in Asia? Did Truman use the bomb to intimidate Stalin? Was it right to destroy civilian women and children in the name of a military or perhaps a largely political cause? Another perspective, uh, Gar Alpera, um, Alperovitz, uh, Truman's explanation of the decision uh, is a myth that Americans tell themselves to ease their minds. Japan would have surrendered shortly without the devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. One million lives, including a large number of American lives, were not at stake. The bomb was used to get the upper hand in the Cold War with communism that the world predicted for the future, especially after Truman's discouraging meeting with Stalin at Potsdam. Uh, John Dower, another um, interpretation, asserted at least implicitly that the decision was fueled by anti-Asian racism. Primary sources from the World War II era painted Germans and Italians only as political and mi military foes. The Japanese were painted, however, as a different, a bestial race, a subhuman species. This racialized construction of Japanese made it easier to drop bombs on them to treat them as beasts, like Truman said. Well, food for thought, of course. We don't have time to talk about all those things today, but I'd love to do it in the tutorials if you like. Um, but, of course, I just want to close by saying, you know, uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, from the scriptures, Mosiah 29, 12, It is better that a man should be judged of God than of man, for the judgments of God are always just, but the judgments of man are not always just. Um, and then um, I would encourage you um, to go um, on your time. You can either go to the PowerPoint here uh, or go to the end sign. Uh, December 2004, there is a wonderful, absolutely amazing story. I have a French class in the room at this point, so I need to, I need to end, unfortunately. Um, but I do encourage you to read this. This is uh, James E. Faust, President Faust, The Power of Peace. Um, and it is this great story um, about um, a man, Kenneth Brown, who was serving as a U.S. Marine of Japan following uh, the dropping uh, of the bomb. Um, and he talks about... Um, a Japanese Christian he met at Christmas time in Nagasaki. Uh, it's a very moving story, a wonderful story uh, about forgiveness, the power to heal, the power of the gospel that far eclipses even the might of atomic bombs. Um, I have a testimony of that. I'm grateful for it. Um, and uh, thank you so much for your great participation today. I look forward to our tutorials talking more about this. But I do encourage you to read this story. Uh, you may remember it, but it's a wonderful one. It certainly deserves a second read through. Well, thanks so much, everybody. And uh, let's talk uh, more about, about all these things at our tutorials. And then see you tomorrow. Uh, there's a new schedule online if you want to know about the readings for the next couple weeks, uh, and including tomorrow and all that. Uh, but thank you so much, and uh, see you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.